of God. Y'all go to, with me to the book of uh, James tonight. Book of James. Y'all ready to get into the Word? Come on, y'all ready to get into the Word? Hey, Donald, didn't we have a good time Sunday night? Oh, my goodness, man. We was at the prison. The place was packed out full. Uh, there was only two mamas in the place. Of course, it was the men's prison. And uh, we, we preached, and we had a good time, and God moved, and Man, uh, half of the congregation was standing at the end, dedicating their lives and giving their life to Christ and, and making their appointments with God and renewing their relationship with God. It, it was a powerful evening. I, I was just uh, totally worn out by Sunday night after two services Sunday morning and that service that night. But it was a good worn out, you know, preaching the gospel. They're so hungry for the real thing. Are you all hungry for the real thing? There's a lot of people preaching a lot of things, but it's not all coming out of the Bible. I talked to a friend of mine from the mission field uh, this afternoon. They moved to Dallas, and they're moving around. They've moved about three times since they've been back in the States. And she said, I've only found about uh, three churches out of all the moves I've been in that actually I could tell that they were preaching the Word of God and not just tickling everybody's ear to keep them coming. It would actually tell you the truth. So not everyone that's preaching the word is preaching the truth. Y'all know that? Y'all figured that out? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that you're going to lead us and guide us into all the truth that your word is going to speak to our hearts. The incorruptible seed of the word of God is going to be planted into our lives, and it will not return to you void, but it will accomplish in us your purpose, what will glorify you. And it will change us, even tonight, from faith to faith, from glory to glory, so that we'll be more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's just read through this chapter 1. This whole book of James is a great book. How many of y'all love the book of James? The the book of James is so practical. It's so real. And so we're going to just let it speak to us tonight. And uh, I'm thinking about starting next next Wednesday night. We're going to go through the book of Romans. Starting with Romans 1 and just go through the book of Romans. That's a great book. So you got to hold on. It might take a while for us to get through the book of Romans. Great theological book, practical book, life-changing book, and it's going to minister to our community because we have a lot of Roman Catholics in the community, so it speaks into that genre of thinking. So uh, spread the word and come, and we're going to start going through the book of Romans. We're going to do an exegesis of the book of Romans. But we're going to look at this chapter 1 and see what the Lord has to say tonight. James, verse 1, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings, he's greeting them. Now listen to what he says. We looked at this last Wednesday. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now let's let's just look at that for a second. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many of y'all like trials? How many of y'all fall into trials at times? Things happen. How many of y'all jump into a few trials and you need to repent for doing that? (laughs) But most of the time we fall into trials. Now this word trials here, same thing as temptation, tempted. It's things that come into our life to test us. We fall into tests. We fall into trials. And... uh, it doesn't, sp- it doesn't give us a, 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 where the trials come from right here. It's, it doesn't specify that. So trials come from different places. Y'all realize that? Some of the trials you have are just coming from your stupid behavior. Would you agree? You jump into it, your flesh. You're still learning how to crucify your flesh. And you're going through trials and t- tribulation, testing because of something on the inside of you. And sometimes until that thing comes out and get exposed, get exposed, you, you never really understand what's going on on the inside of you. So you fall into a trial that comes from yourself. I mean, you know, the enemy will tempt you and cause you to fall into trials. But he's going to be tempting something that's in you. You remember I've been teaching about iniquity, that thing that's in all of us that's bent to do our own thing, bent to do what the world wants us to do. Well, that's what he's tempting. He's not tempting something that, doesn't, uh, that you don't desire. He only can tempt you with what tempts you, whatever you lust after, whatever you think about, whatever you're going after. He can't tempt you about something that, that you're not uh, desiring. Some people hate smoke. 
He, so he can't tempt them to smoke a cigarette. Anybody in here is not tempted to smoke? I'm not tempted to smoke. And I used to smoke when I was young. Because God changed that in me. And there's different things that, de that they doesn't tempt me. Anybody tempted by sushi? I am now. I used to think it would be nasty. Some of y'all are like, oh, I wouldn't eat that. That's raw fish. Well, you hadn't eaten the same raw fish I have. It's pretty good. But some things just you don't desire it, so it doesn't tempt you. Where do these desires come from? They come from an inside. Now, there's godly desires on the inside of us, and then there's what? There's iniquity, our own desires, selfish desires, worldly desires that are on the inside. Now, some trials come from God. Now, see, some people don't like you to say that. I looked up that word, and it says there are trials that are come into your life that are supposed to be beneficial for working out God's divine purpose in your life. I, don't, I didn't like that when I was reading that in the Vines uh, Dictionary. It, it, it's a divinely permitted, say permitted, yes. or sent trial that comes into our lives to work out God's divine purpose in us. Some people get stuck, and if you stay stuck, God will allow, permit, or even send something that's going to cause you to fall into a trial so that you can grow. Now, some of y'all looking at me like, I don't like to hear that kind of teaching. Just give me some faith words that I can keep quoting. We go, go to a little bit to the right and go to uh, 1 Peter. And look with me at chapter 1. In verse 6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice. He just said, count it all joy. And now Peter's saying, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, say for a little while. Well, let me just say this. Every trial, every storm compared to God's eternity in your life is a little while. It doesn't feel like a little while when you're in it. Anybody ever been on a, a boat and got seasick? It doesn't seem like a little while while you're in that storm, does it? Or that ocean's doing like this. You want to get off of that boat. You want to put your feet on the ground, and you, you don't want to be sick no more. Okay? But it, it seems like forever, but it's still just a little while. And then I love this next uh, part. He says, if need be. So it's, it, God doesn't always send trials to teach us. The best way to learn is by wisdom, by being led by the Holy Spirit, by getting into the Word of God, being a student of the Word of God, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, having friends in Christ that you can share uh, your, your life with and, and expose your iniquity to them and have them pray with you and hold you accountable. All these things are ways of, of growing without having to endure trials. But yet, God will still allow us permit trials into our lives because He wants us to grow. So he, right here He says, In this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved with various trials. Trials will grieve you, don't they? Now, if you've never been in a real big trial, it gets down on the inside of you right here. Anybody been in one of those kind of trials where it gets down in here? It's not up here. If all you're having is trials in your head, then praise God for that. But when it drops down into your gut, into your spirit, into your, your emotional area... It's tough, okay? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking now from experience. And, but I still got to realize that it's just for a while, a little while. I like that word in there. For a little while, if need be, because God is still doing a work in the midst of it. He still wants me to keep growing. Amen? He still wants me to be a better son tomorrow than I am today. He wants me to mature in my faith. And last Wednesday, I talked about you have a perfect love on the inside of you. Say, I have perfect love on the inside of me. Say it. Because God's love is on the inside of you if you're his son and daughter. You've also got that measure of faith, which is God's faith. You've got perfect faith on the inside of you. But I'm telling you right now that love has not been perfected, and that faith has not been perfected. Even though it's perfect, you've got to perfect it. And one of the ways this happens is God allows you permits, and sometimes sends trials that is going to test that faith so that it will mature. How many of y'all want to have mountain-moving faith? 
how will you ever know it's going to move a mountain if there's never a mountain to move? So y'all want to pray for mountains? No. So he says, if need be, you have been grieved. Uh, my, my Bible tells me that word grieves also means distressed by various trials. Every trial that comes into your life is a distress. But God is going to do a work if we get our eyes on him and believe his promises. He says that the genuineness in verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith. Let's see how genuine your faith is. Being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I know some people want to teach right there. That's the revelation, the return of Jesus Christ. That's the rapture. That's not what he's talking about right there. Re revelation simply means the unveiling, the revealing. In other words, whenever you're going through a trial and a tribulation, you're going through trouble, you look at what Jesus promised you and give faith. Let, let your faith work. And you look at it, he said, this is only going to be for a little while, and even though it doesn't feel like it, even though it's grieving me and distressing me, I'm going to keep the faith, I'm going to let it mature my faith, I'm going to let my faith grow. Come on, how many of y'all with me here tonight? And it's, and it's going to be a testing so that I'll end up knowing I have genuine faith now. And you know how you know you have, how to know you have genuine faith? Because you don't quit. We're going to get back to... Uh, to James, because you got to be patient. That means endure. you got to have endurance in the midst of it, because if you quit, you lose. Yep, you'll just go around the mountain again. That's right, and you'll, you'll just go around like the children in the wilderness. One more lap. Let's take one more lap. Any of y'all get tired of taking another lap? Amen. Then we got to let the process work, and, and you've got to let the perfect faith in you be perfected. Let the perfect love in you be perfected or become perfect love or mature. Let's read that again, verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, which perishes, so we shouldn't be seeking after the gold in the world, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and the glory of and, and glory at the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Now, what, what is he really talking about? When you go through a trial and you don't quit, you endure, guess what's going to be manifest in your life? Jesus Christ is going to begin to be revealed through you in a way that he's never been revealed before. We're supposed to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. But we don't like the transformation, the metamorphosis that sometimes takes place in us going there or getting there. But he's always at work in us to reveal something through us. And what he really wants to reveal is not our junk, but his son, his, himself. Let's keep going. Whom having not seen you love. How many of you love the one you've never seen? Has anybody in here ever shook hands with Jesus and met him? No. He's spirit. He's, well, he's, he's at the right hand bodily of, of the Father right now. He sent the Holy Spirit down. A few people in, in our lifetime say that they've seen or met and talked with Jesus. That's all right with them, you know, but most people never see him. But how many of y'all still love him anyway? Amen. How does that work? Faith. You've got to believe that he loves you. I haven't seen him, but I still believe he loves me. That's faith. Some people, they, they say, if I can't see it, I'm not going to believe it. How can you see love? Unless it's demonstrated. How did we see his love? It was demonstrated. Where was it demonstrated? At the cross. No other person ever did what Jesus did. The God who became flesh and died on a cross being sinless and became sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice 
with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You ever notice how we can get caught up in just rejoicing and singing and praising God and clapping and shouting? Why do we do that? We haven't seen him, but we still know him. We know his love. We believe he loves us. No one loves you like Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say that. No one loves you like Jesus. So believing, you ought to be rejoicing with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. A joy that is so overwhelming, how do you express it? There's a word called tehillah. It's a, a Hebrew word for the word praise, which means to be clamorously foolish. You ever just feel like just being a fool for Jesus? Amen. And that's why, because you love him and he loves you. Then he says, receiving the end of your faith. Now, this lets me know I've got to continue in my faith. I can't quit. I shouldn't stop. When a trial comes, it may grieve me. Whatever it is, I've got to receive the end of my faith. I've got to go till the reward comes. I almost pulled my ear off early, and this thing still ain't got adjusted right. <laughs> receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So that means if you quit, you're going to go to hell? No, that's not what it means, does it? Because you're a three-part being. What are you? Spirit, soul, and body. Come on, all three. When you got born again, your spirit and God's spirit became one spirit. I've taught you this many, many times. We've got to get back to the basics or we start misinterpreting Scripture. And we think that if I don't pass the test, what happens? I'm lost. I'm not saved. He says the salvation of your soul, your intellect, your mind, your will, your emotions, that part of you that's being sanctified is going to have to go back through it again. Like Ann said, you're going to have to go back around the mountain one more time again to get your mind right, to get your emotions right. Your soul, your soul is different from your spirit. When you got born again, your spirit and God's spirit became one. You're a child of God, and you're going to be working on your soul for the rest of your life. And God is letting us know one of the ways your soul is going to be perfected or matured, the love that's in it that is going to come out and become a mature love and a mature faith or a perfect love and a perfect faith is you're going to have to have it tested at times. Amen. And when it's being tested, don't quit. Amen. We go through things, and I tell you, I get, I, I've been angry at God. Anybody had a few words with God before? Not like I'm going to beat him up or nothing. It's like, I just don't understand, God. He said, just keep going. You might. <laughs> he didn't say you will. You might understand. One day we will when we get to our homeland. Until then, we've got to grab a hold of the word of God. And my pastor tells me this all the time. He says, grab a root and growl. Don't quit. You ever heard that before? Grab a root and growl. That's, that's some... Texas slang or something. I don't know. All I know, if you're grabbing a root and a growl, that probably ain't pulling the root out. You ain't going nowhere. You're not quitting. And this is what it says in verse 10. We kind of, we, we break it, but it says, of this salvation, what salvation? The salvation of the soul, not the spirit, not the body, the transformation of the inner man, the prophets having inquired and uh, searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searched, searching what and what manner of time. Now listen, he's talking about the Old Testament prophets. Now listen to this. They were searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ. I thought the Spirit of Christ is only a New Testament spirit. He was working all the way through the Bible, guys. Amen. Genesis 1 1, the Spirit of Christ was there. This is Christianity from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. It's not half Judaism, half Christianity. It's all Christianity. And whenever you get born again, you will see Jesus in all of the pages if you see, if you know him. Amen. How many of y'all have ever been reading the Bible and all of a sudden you're reading about Joseph and all of a sudden you look and you say, that's really not talking about Joseph. That, that's talking about Jesus. Amen. Joseph is a type of Jesus. Jonah in the belly of the well, a type of Jesus. Amen. All of those, all the Old Testament people, you can find Christ when you look at them. You know what I mean by a type? It's a type and shadow. Amen. Cain and Abel. Cain was a type of the enemy. Abel was a type of Christ. He goes down into the field of, of Cain. 
Jesus comes down into the field of Cain, of the world, of fallen man. And what does man do? Kills him in his own field. Read the parables. That's what some of those parables mean. He comes to his own vineyard and they kill him and say, we're going to take his, his vineyard for ourselves. All of these things are pictures of Jesus. What do you think all of the Old Testament sacrifices of the animals were about? They were sacrificing lambs, goats, and bulls, and all of those lambs, goats, and bulls were types of Jesus. Because once he was sacrificed, there's never another sacrifice that God will ever accept. Except the sacrifice of your praise, the fruit of your lips giving thanks to his name, even in the midst of the mess. Two Sundays ago, I talked about the homeland. I said, you will not endure this world if you don't know where your true home is. Y'all remember that? But when you know your homeland is heaven and God has a glorious body for you, he's got a plan bigger than you can ever imagine. It's called eternity with him. You can endure this time down here, which is like a flower here today and gone tomorrow. Mark Dozal, he usually sits about right there on Wednesday night. His mom passed away yesterday. She's with Jesus. Y'all be praying for the family. Just for you to know, the wake is tomorrow night at Hickson Brothers in Marksville. Uh, His sister comes, the Carmouche family comes. Several people from from that family come to the church. If you can, go by there and visit them. If you don't know who Mark Dozai is, he's a little guy that sits right there that paints. About an hour before that, another church member, Betty DeSalle. How many of you know Betty DeSalle? Her mama passed away the same day, same morning. So tomorrow we'll be doing a wake here in the morning from 8 o'clock. The funeral service will be at 11. Because Betty got saved under this ministry and brought her mom over here. And her mama got saved under this ministry. And guess where mama is? In heaven. How can you endure this earth if you don't have a heaven? How can you put up with all of the stuff that goes on if we don't have a homeland? How do you endure the various trials if we don't look to the promises that God has for us? So if some of y'all are off tomorrow, come by in the morning and see them, visit them, hug their neck. Do what you can, but be praying for the DeSalle family and uh, the Doza family. Would y'all be doing that? But this, he says, these prophets were looking. He says, what manner, it's searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ Who was in them. Now get this. The Old Testament prophets had the same spirit in them as we had. Wow. That kind of challenges some people's theology, doesn't it? Was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Why does he bring this up? Because if Jesus suffered, do you think you're ever going to suffer? Now see, this is not a popular message in the faith church or full gospel ministry or the Pentecostal churches or the the faith teachers, the prosperity teachers, they don't want to tell you about the suffering side of things. And whenever something hits you upside the head and you start to suffer, you say, what's the matter? This stuff must not work. It's time to start working it and you're going to see it work. Amen. Amen. Go with me back to James. I did get to verse 2, didn't I? A couple of pages to the left. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Same thing Peter said. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Almost saying the exact same thing. But now he says this testing of your faith, this trial, this this thing you're going through is going to produce in you patience. And my Bible lets me know, if you have a good study of the Bible, it says endurance and perseverance. is going to produce in me a faith that doesn't quit. A faith that endures. A faith that perseveres. I don't like those words. The flesh doesn't like those. My spirit likes those words, but my flesh doesn't like those words. I started to work out again. Help me, Jesus. (laughs) You got to persevere. You got to endure. And what's interesting is 
I was stupid enough to get a personal trainer to help me. <laughs> so they make sure that you persevere and you endure or they bark at you. Amen? But you know what? If I persevere and endure, I'm going to have, it's going to produce something in me. It's going to cause something different in me that if I don't do that, it wouldn't happen. Amen. Now, it's the same thing for your spirit as it is for your body and it is for your soul. You've got to go through the endurance of these testings and, and things that come against your soul the salvation of your soul, and you've got to endure. You've got to let that patience be there. It means you don't quit, and you endure because it's going to what? Look at verse 4. And let patience, let this endurance, this perseverance, have its perfect work, that you may be mature, perfected. Come into that perfected faith, mature faith, and mature love. Be perfect, perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Look at that promise. How many of you like to be perfect and complete and lacking nothing? Amen. Well, you got to sign up for the gym. <laughs> the Word gym, the Holy Ghost gym. Amen? And guess who your personal trainer is? Pastor Mark, no. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, because I'm not there all the time. But I'm one of His ones that help. Amen? And so you, you got to, do you understand that God is always training us, growing us, maturing us? And when we stop, we become stagnant. And guess what he'll allow to happen? If need be, you may have to go through various trials. Because he doesn't want you to just wander around the wilderness forever. Amen. He wants you to be one of the sons and daughters that enter into the promised land. The promised land is being complete and lacking nothing. All of them wanted to enter the promised land. But what did they do when they came out of Egypt? They murmured and complained and they kept looking. If I could just go back to Egypt, was it really that good? Yeah, it was. I had food. I had, but don't you remember you was also a slave over there? Oh, but... I didn't have to put up with Moses, that, that preacher. I didn't have to keep listening to him. And this is real in people's lives. Amen. They get saved and they get in church and then they find out. They, I mean, when somebody first gets saved, they're usually excited. They go into every class. They're reading their Bible. They're moving. Their first love is exciting. They, how many of y'all were the same way? And, and, and you're sharing that with everyone around you. Then the people around you, they're not excited as you are. So you get hit and then you get knocked down. Then you come to church and you find out, find out that one of your brothers or sisters that's been a Christian for 20 years fell and they sinned and they did something wrong. And you can't believe it. You said, I've just become a Christian. If I was a Christian for 20 years, I would never have a problem. <laughs> that's because we've been teaching them that. That's, right. that's what the preachers have been teaching them. They don't prepare them for the trials that are going to come because of their faith. Think about that. Every one of you has the, has the same amount of faith. How many of y'all believe that? Amen. That's what the Bible says. You've got a perfect faith on the inside of you. You've got the measure of faith. He already gave you that mustard seed of faith. Many different ways to say You have it. But if you don't work it, it will never grow. You know when a baby is born, that little baby boy has the same number of muscles in its body as I have. Same exact number of muscles. If I'm normal and the baby's normal. Right? Amen. Can that baby lift what I can lift? It can't even hold a bottle when it's born. So it's got to be trained. The baby has to be taught. It has to start using its muscles. It's got to start using everything so that it can be a human being that can communicate and talk and move. And then as that child grows, the more you work your muscles, the stronger your muscles are going to be, right? Amen. Does that mean, you ever seen those guys that are all pumped up, you know, the ones that you don't want to go work out at the gym when they're there? They just scare you. I mean, that's all they do. 
Somebody says, don't go at this time because you're not going to have any plates to lift up on. I said, I don't need any plates to lift up on right now anyway. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> but just because they can lift 300 pounds, does that mean they have more muscles in number? No, they've learned to work the muscles that they have. Same thing with your faith. You've got a perfect faith on, already on the inside. If you don't start working it, you'll never, it'll never grow. But we want to have strong faith. We want to have mountain-moving faith. But we don't want to have to go through the testing and the trials or the, the, the sitting under the Word because the best way to get faith, faith comes by hearing. hearing and hearing the Word of God. And when you hear the way He's talking, you obey. And when you hear and obey, he says, you'll eat the fruit of the land. You'll eat the good of the land. He says, but if you hear in the same chapter, I'm not going to get into every word of this chapter because I'm barely getting through the first verses, and I didn't know if I'd have enough chapter to make it. Can you believe that? <laughs> He's going to say, he who hears the word and is not a doer of the word, he deceives himself. He produces nothing. He's double-minded in all of his ways is what the scripture says. A person who doesn't have the wisdom of God, and that's what he goes on to say right here, says, if anyone lacks wisdom, in verse 5, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given. Sometimes we don't have anything because we don't ask. That we, in verse chapter 4, he tells us that. You do not have because you do not ask, and when you ask, you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own lust, your own desires. This, this book is just so weaved together beautifully if you'd ever just sit down and read it. It's one of these things you can read every day and get something different out of it. He says, so if any one of you lacks wisdom, and I can probably say we all lack wisdom, don't we? How many of y'all can use some more wisdom? Yeah. Ask. But when you ask, what does he say? But let him ask in verse 6. In faith. How do you ask in faith? What does it mean in faith? Is it like you go put on a faith suit? No, it means ask trusting your Father. Ask believing there's a God who hears you. Ask in faith. Even though you don't see Him, you love Him. And you rejoice. And you don't quit because you're going to receive the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul, the growing of your soul. And He's teaching the exact same thing in the same chapter. He says, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, tossed, uh, driven and tossed by the wind. That's what I was talking about. You ever been on a boat? Ooh, you, you know, tossed and driven. I went with my son yesterday. He, uh, I gave him my old boat, old, old boat, a couple of years ago. And he kind of been working on it. And he finally got it running. So he was going to go test run it down Spring Bayou. And the motor is running so good, it'll probably go about 40 miles an hour. But the steering cable hadn't been worked on. <laughs> it's not fun when you're going 40 miles an hour and the boat decides it wants to turn to the bank. And you keep turning the wheel and nothing happens. And when you're in spring by, the bank's not far away. Nope. <laughs> I was tossed to and fro. <laughs> you don't want to be tossed to and fro. We got the thing turned around. Here I am in the back hole in a big 70, and I'm driving it <laughs> like this <laughs> so we can get back to the, the boat dock. I'm just holding the motor and try, drive. It didn't have a stick on it or nothing so, so we could get back to the boat ramp. We had a blast. Amen. Amen. I was already worked out before I went work out. I was, <laughs> I was, I was sweating on the, on the boat motor, man. I said, I'm supposed to go work out with my other son tonight and, and this trainer. I said, oh, no, I don't know about all this stuff. Oh, glory. It says, for let that, it says, let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. When I'm talking to you, are you talking to somebody that's doubting all the time? They're one way one second, one way the next second. One way they believe, next thing they're doubting. 
The Bible says don't let that person believe they're going to receive anything from God with that kind of mindset. I can't lie to them and say, you know, God's going to move in this thing. No, if you're not in faith, if you, if you keep, if you, and he, t he calls it double-minded in the next scripture. He says this person is double-minded and unstable in all of their ways. Have I met people that are unstable? It's because they do not trust God. That's the root of it. And when you're not in faith, you're in fear. Say fear. And, and I, told, I taught y'all last Wednesday what I thought the greatest fear is. Our greatest fear is that God will not fulfill His promise. We're not really afraid to die if you're saved. You're not afraid of the devil. You know he's defeated. But you're afraid that if you really trust God in this thing, that God's not going to do what He's promised. It's really a fear of doubt. You doubting. And that fear is producing a doubt in you. So you're afraid to really let go and let God, so you're going to try to hold on to it yourself instead of trusting God with it, and you're double-minded, you're unstable in all of your ways, and the Bible says don't let you believe you're going to receive anything from God with that kind of attitude of faith. Spirit of faith is what the Bible calls it. So have the right spirit of faith. Amen? Amen. Let me just look at verse 12 real quick before we close. I know they video and they, they want some time back there. It says, Blessed is the man who endures, that's that patience, perseveres the temptation, the trial." The testing that comes at you. For when he has been proved, when he finally passes the test, what does it say? He's going to get something. He will receive a crown of life. See, we like all those rewards, right? Perfect and lacking nothing. Crown of life. Salvation of the soul. But we don't like all of the things sometimes that we go through to get those things. Paul said the Christian life is like an athlete who runs. He runs for the prize. He runs to win. And if you don't, don't have that attitude, you're going to just be lazy in your Christianity. And one adversity is going to come against you, and you're going to back off and stop. And uh, Hebrews 10, the last verse there, says, uh, last two verses of chapter 10, it says God has no pleasure in those who draw back. It says God's soul has no pleasure. You know, God has a soul too. That's one of the only places in the Bible that talks about God having a soul. He says, so he'll receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised, promised, promised to those who what? Love, Love him. Now, what is a crown of life? Where does the crown go? On your head. I believe it's talking about this. Spiritualize it a little bit with me. Whenever you pass the test, when you're tempted and you don't give in to the temptation, you're able to find the way of escape. Y'all know the, all those scriptures. And you find your way of escape. Then the temptation comes the next time. How many know it's easier to overcome it? Then there comes a time when that thing that was tempting you doesn't even tempt you anymore. You just had your mind sealed. You just got that crown of life. And that part of your soul is, going, is, is already been touched by heaven. And that's part of the reward. That doesn't draw you away from God like it did before. It's a process. That iniquity finally gets changed by His glory. That desire, if you keep reading, because He says you're only drawn away by your own desires. That desire changes because God gives you His desires. You know when it says He gives you the desires of your heart? People think He'll give you anything you want. He's actually saying, I'm going to put into you my desires. I'll give you the desires of your heart. They'll come from me from now on. Amen. Did y'all get that? Amen. But we've got to remove ours. Amen. How do we know they get removed until we have a test? I mean, I want to be an overcomer. Amen. What is an overcomer? Is it someone that what? Gets over. I just overcame that chair. Just got over it. <laughs> Every time I do that, it makes people laugh. Haven't done it in a long time, but I got your attention. But spiritually, we like to just say overcomers. Well, it's getting over it, but that's a lot easier said than done. In fact, when somebody just comes to tell me, you just need to get over it, I want to punch them. <laughs> I was talking to the wall. Y'all heard that when I was walking up? <laughs> Any of y'all ever felt that way? 
You're going through your trial and they come up, they're so spiritual because they're not in their trial at that time. You just need to get over it, Pastor. I love you, man. Lay hands on you and pray for you. What do you think the book of Job's about? His three friends were pretty much the get over at God. God wasn't too pleased with them either. Not at all. But in the end, Job prayed for his friends. And what did God do for Job? He restored all, double, everything. What a story. And that starts off with a man that's blameless and upright. But people want to say Job endured all that because he sinned. Well, I got news for all you perfect people. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So every one of you are susceptible to the exact same thing that happened to Job, but for the grace of God. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, this endurance that we're talking about is one of the fruits of your spirit. This patience, this perseverance, this all comes from you. And without you, we can do nothing, Lord God. But with you, we can do all things. So Lord, in these times in our lives, we ask that your spirit would rise up in us and complete the work that you desire to be completed in us because you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we have laid our lives before you and you said when we trust you, you would even uphold, uphold us and cause us never even to stumble. Lord, let us learn to trust you like that. To come to you as a child, trusting you through every situation. May we look at you, Father, as the true father of our lives. Just like a little child puts all their trust in their daddy that they would jump off of a, a roof or a car into his arms. May we have that same trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, lift his counts upon you and give you peace. I bless you tonight in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Tell your neighbor, endure.